All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Graco Pumpcast. My name is Brendan Forrest, and I'm here today with Jeff Schaefer, our sanitary product manager, and Jeremy Williams, our process technical trainer. Today, we're going to talk about a recent test that we did in our sanitary demo lab uh, where we pumped a fruit cocktail with one of our high sand uh, diaphragm pumps. So we're going to talk about Fruit cocktail, we're gonna talk about fruit products, we'll talk about the pump test that we did, and we'll talk about the cleaning that we also did. Um, so let's uh, just jump right into talking about fruit cocktail, fruit products in general. So what characteristics do these fruit products usually have? So from a fruit cocktail perspective, one of the most obvious ones is probably chunks of fruit, right? Uh, we pump a lot of material, a lot of it is very um, consistent throughout, it doesn't have chunks as ingredients, but fruit cocktail, you know, pineapple, grapes, oranges, whatever it may be, large chunks of fruit and kind of a watery base. Uh, so you need to be able to handle, have the equipment that can handle those large chunks of fruit. Yeah, and I think uh, it's really important to also remember that with the fruit that is uh, in the process, that the consistency of the fruit is different. Uh, mm -hmm. You think about like, everyone loves the little red cherries. Mm -hmm. um, those little red cherries are actually very, very soft. Same thing with like the grapes, but then you have little pieces of pear and things mm -hmm. like that that may be harder right. also. So mm -hmm. keeping the integrity of that ingredient as you're moving it through, um, but also knowing that it could turn into a homogenous <laughs> uh, slurry of mm -hmm. things if uh, if you don't treat the material well. Sure. Right. So is there obviously like what the cocktail is made out of to like the base is uh, important, right? So a lot of cocktails have syrups, mm -hmm. a lot of them have water. Uh, so those are different things we have to consider when we're looking at the base of the cocktail. Yeah, probably just making sure it's not too thick, right? Because if you get like a real sticky syrupy mixture, um, you could have issues pumping it with a pump that can handle the chunks, right? Uh, for the most part, they're pretty watery. Mm -hmm. So we don't run into too many like problems. Like a light syrup or a water. Like a light syrup, yeah. yeah. But that, that would probably be the biggest thing. There is, uh, when you think about uh, fruit cocktails, there's also the idea of like fillings, like pie fillings mm -hmm, and things mm -hmm. like that, that are kind of the similar idea of some type of fruit or vegetable that's in a suspension. Um, in those pie fillings, that is a situation where now you're looking at something that is more, uh, more solid in nature. It doesn't really have a nice flow or as nice of a flow because it's not water. It is actually like a fruit puree, you know, mm -hmm. syrup uh, mix. So it's a little bit harder to move that kind of material. And we would use a different piece of equipment for that yeah. versus the fruit cocktail sure. that we right. pumped in the video. Right. So when you talk about pie filling, then you start talking a lot about more sugar added to the product as well, right? Mm -hmm. Which is another thing we have to consider. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. So we kind of hit this a little bit, but uh, so what ingredients are we typically going to find in a fruit cocktail or even just, you know, those little cups of fruit, you know, just a, a single pear or pineapple or something? Yeah, so it uh, it really does depend on the the, the brand on uh, what their kind of expectations are for it. Um, usually, when you look at how these things are delivered or how the material is delivered, uh, it's coming in a big vat. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes things settle out. Uh, sometimes there's different proportions, or maybe the process that they're using to make that material. Maybe they send it in layers. So mm -hmm. there's you know maybe a layer of peach and then a layer of pears and a layer of uh, grapes and things like that. So uh, using some technology that's out there uh, that can do some of that mixing as well is some uh, benefit. Yeah, I mean, basically fruit, right? Like we talked about, and then yeah. a simple syrup. Um, I also think it depends on where we're at in the pumping, right? If we're mm -hmm. pumping the end product, um, then you're going to have the syrups and sugars and that kind of stuff. But somehow they got to get the fruit to that point where they're mixing the syrup with it, right? So in, a, in this processing facility, there's probably an area where they're pumping diced or cut up fruit with just water. Mm -hmm. um, and we have pumps in both applications, right? Whether it's just water mixed with fruit or whether it's kind of end product packaging where you're feeding it to a hopper or something like that. Okay. Is there any considerations we need to make when we're talking about the size of the fruit chunks? Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean... Um, I mean, like the, like the classic like big pineapple chunks in the can, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's a lot different than what you're going to get in a little... Uh, packaged cup of fruit cocktail right so making sure your pump can handle and, and generally speaking you know talking about equipment we use flapper check diaphragm pumps to handle fruit right okay. um, so a lot of our pumps are we have ball check pumps out there they don't pass as large of solids that's kind of what we say so we look at solid size and we can go up to just shy of four inches i think it's like 3.75 inches we can handle on our largest pump uh, which is pretty big chunks of fruit right i've seen us pump anything like half or quartered peaches or pears and that kind of stuff okay. so um but if it's fruit cocktail and it's diced up pretty small, you can probably use a smaller pump to pump it. If it's big, big chunks and you don't want it to clog, then you need a larger pump. Is there, 
we'll start tra- transitioning into uh, into how to pump this product. Um, is there going to be any considerations if you're pumping multiple different sizes of fruit that you need to be aware of? Um, you know, if you go to a bigger pump, like you're going to have less suction, or is there is that a problem that you might run into? Yeah, so you, we do look at that uh, as kind of a consideration that. First and foremost, uh, you want to make sure you right size that pump. You get the the right size opening uh, for the material to pass through, but also how fast you're running that pump. So it's um, not really a one size fits all pump. It's kind of it's got to be dialed into the specific application. Correct. And you, you think about like a large, uh, and even in uh, the, the application that Jeffers are talking about, uh, maybe in the beginning part of that process where it's more of the raw fruit that's mm-hmm. chopped up, it may be a smaller pump that's moving from each individual product area to a mixed kettle or something along those lines. And then there you're looking at a larger size that's moving the entire product Mm -hmm. uh, through the system. So I think having uh, the different sizes and the capability is important. Um, It's also important based on that, uh, the the material consistency. So having a pair uh, is going to be able to hold up to a lot more pressure. Uh, You might even be able to get a pair through on a smaller pump then let's say um, a cherry or yeah. something like that, where the smaller pump is going to smash that cherry yeah, okay. and you're not going to have to deal with it. So. Yeah, and ultimately what this all comes down to, which we haven't mentioned specifically, is you want the fruit or the material to look the same after it's pumped, mm-hmm. right? So if you're if you're pumping diced vegetables, diced fruit, whatever it may be, you don't want to smash that product, right? And then have it mush on the, on the outbound side. So a lot of pumps struggle with that, right? So spec the specific type of equipment, like a flapper pump, where it's going to be gentle, and it's going to pass that fruit product through without any kind of real damage to the fruit. That's what we're looking for. Right. So we've been talking about diaphragm pumps here. Is there any other yeah. pump technology that can handle fruit? You know, talking, like you said, Jeff, to get, mm-hmm. keep it the same from point A to point B. Uh, are diaphragms kind of the only game in town? Yeah, they're not the only game in town. There are some other pumps that are pretty gentle. Um, sign pumps, like an eccentric sign pump, are pretty gentle in a rotary pump. Um albeit they have their limitations. Um, I've seen some people utilize twin screw pumps for this type of application. They work okay. Uh, They run pretty fast, and I've seen some damage, and they're going to be a little bit limited on size capacity as well. So um, ultimately, right, there's probably not a one-size-fits-all pump for this, right? It's about figuring out, you know, as Jeremy mentioned, what's your flow rate? Where are you pumping it to? What kind of particle size that you have? And getting all that information and then going back to the the pump manufacturer and saying, okay, this is what I need to do. Right? How does your pump work, and how does it fit my application? So, um, where, like, talking about the process, right? Raw fruit to little cup of fruit. Mm-hmm. What are where are, what are, where are the pumps used in that situation? Like, so in the process, what pumps are used to do what? So, from what I've seen, generally speaking, um, there's a process where they actually chop the fruit. Mm-hmm. And then it goes into usually a hopper with some water and they're going to get some fruit juices in it. And there's a pump there to pump it into another tank or something like that. And then they'll probably do some sort of mixing at that point in time with a simple syrup or whatever other stuff they're putting in it. Um, if they're making a pie filling, right, as Jeremy mentioned, they'll have to mix other stuff in. And then on that tank, there's another pump on the bottom outlet of it that will pump it to probably a filling station or a hopper or something like that. Yeah, and I, I want to add into that also. Uh, we're, we're talking a lot about the, the fruit itself, mm-hmm. but the syrups. Yeah. Uh, the syrups have to be moved into those product yeah. areas as mm-hmm. well, into those mixed kettles. So uh, that may be a different technology. It may not be a flapper pump. It may mm-hmm. be a ball check pump in that okay. situation. Um, but it's just important to think that it's not only the main solid right. ingredient, but there's also the carrier that you're, yeah. you're going to be moving mm-hmm. as well. So. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, so throughout that process, what are some of the common challenges you two have seen uh, in the field uh, when we're dealing with fruit-based products? Well, one that I can think of right off the bat uh, is people wanting, kind of getting that urge to run the pump as fast as possible right away. Um, you can end up essentially starving the pump where it just does not want to move anything. Uh, are you so, talking about serving the pump with product or with air? Both. Both, okay. Yeah, so essentially they're by going from zero to 100 – uh, or whatever the, the flow is, um, you're you're starving the system of uh, being able to pull that suction in or to draw that product into the, the pump itself and start moving it. But also, um, kind of in that same vein, when you have a syrup, when you have uh, a solid, if you go too fast or you, you switch too quickly, the pump is going to want to pull and the physical forces are going to want to pull what's lightest. Mm-hmm. What's lightest in that? It's the the fluid. Mm -hmm. So there are some considerations when you look at the operation that you don't want to draw 
that fluid out and end up with a bunch of solids that aren't moving mm-hmm. anywhere. So gradually starting these pumps is oftentimes the, uh, the the biggest issue that I see, the biggest challenge. Yeah. I think uh, product degradation, right? Like making sure you keep the fruit intact is probably first and foremost on most operators' minds in a plant. Um, and then making sure the pump will run, right? I mean, as you're pumping fruit, you're going to get, there are chunks, but there's probably also little really tiny pieces in there too. So making sure pumps don't, um, pack out and get fruit stuck in them and get clogged up and all that kind of stuff. Um, what does the cleaning look like? I know we're going to talk about cleaning what we did, right? But, um, that's a big deal to a lot of operators and how easy it is to clean it and do all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into specifying it. Um, cool. When we're building the pumps, uh, what do we need to keep in mind, especially, you know, a diaphragm pump, it comes with a lot of internal components. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe not so much in the flapper compared to the ball check pumps, but what do we need to be keeping in mind when we're building these pumps out and specking these pumps in for, for products? Well, you brought up uh, just the size is uh, oftentimes the first consideration is how big does that flapper have to be mm-hmm. for it to allow the right amount of uh, material through. Um, I, I'd say that's probably the first thing. Um, probably something to keep in mind with the flappers too, right? If you're talking about a three-inch flapper pump, it's not a three-inch diameter opening, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. And that's and thinking about that from a system standpoint, what are you, where are you putting this in, in the facility mm-hmm. in the plant? Um, the other, I guess, consideration is the diaphragms that you have in there um, and the type of fruit that you're pumping. There are different characteristics in fruit. Uh, everybody kind of thinks of it as being the, you know, sweet, you know, type of thing. But if you're pumping a pineapple, it's a lot of acid. It's a lot of acid, mm-hmm. in there. and what are, where is that acid going? Where is it sitting? And mm-hmm. where are those fibers mm-hmm. going to be in that process? Mm-hmm. Uh, to start thinking about the, the material that you would select, which one is the best one for you? From an acid perspective, right, and compatibility with the fruit, and then you also have to consider, okay, I know I'm going to flush this mm-hmm. pump out, right, and I'm probably going to use some sort of cleaning chemical, mm-hmm. caustic or sanitizer, whatever it may be, and make sure whatever you're cleaning it with is going to be compatible with your internal diaphragm materials as well. Mm-hmm. And then I think the other big thing is specking it out. And you mentioned this earlier is, um, you know, we have air and electric diaphragm pumps, and the larger the air pump and the faster that you run it, the harder it taxes your air system. And making sure that if you're going to put a couple of these in a plant or whatever it may be, that you have enough air to properly run this pump. And if you don't, then maybe an electric's a better choice, right? Because it doesn't consume the kind of air. Um, You do get the better efficiencies with it, but you don't have to worry about your compressor system. Mm -hmm. So, Um, When we're talking about the diaphragms, um, have you seen where like fruit product gets stuck between the diaphragm and the plate to make it more difficult to clean? Yeah, you do see that, especially with uh, our just traditional diaphragm technology. Mm-hmm. Um, overmolded is, is a little bit different kind of demon to, to work with yeah. because it does a very good job of repelling a lot of that. Mm-hmm. But with traditional technology, you see a little bit of that build up over time. Um, the other thing just goes to uh, maintenance is tearing these pumps apart. They're doing their cleaning. When you get those pumps put back together again, if you don't have it 100% exactly lined up the way it's mm-hmm. supposed to, you're going to have little nooks and crannies for that mm-hmm. material to to settle or to sit in. Uh, it's one of the reasons why when you look at- And that's at, where the bacteria is gonna start forming. And that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. And that's why it's very, very important depending on your application that you look at what your cleaning process is going to be and just making sure you have that f- factored in. Yeah. You know what's going on. Yeah, because if you're gonna try to CIP these pumps, with, which a lot of people will try to do, mm-hmm. um, then the open mold is definitely a better option, right? It's, because it's gonna be a lot easier to clean that off mm-hmm. with the diaphragm side plate than, uh, than it would be if you got fruit stuck behind that thing, right? Right. So let's talk about the test that we did in our sanitary demo lab. Um, so first, let's just talk about what pump did we use um, and what uh, internal characteristics do we have in it. Uh, so we used a three-inch flapper pump on our uh, fruit cocktail test, and um, I don't recall the diaphragms on that. Do you recall? Uh, was it overmold of Santa Prine, correct? I don't know if they were overmolded. They were they overmolded. Standard. They were. Okay, yeah. well, then it was overmolded. Yeah. Uh, and that would be an overmolded Teflon. Teflon, Teflon okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, and, and when we look at the overmold Teflon, that is one of our high runners. That's one of the most common that mm-hmm. we see uh, being used in this because of that cleanability. And, and we chose a three inch because I believe looking at the fruit cocktail, mm-hmm. the 1590, which is our other flapper pump size. So we have a three inch, we have an inch and a half, which is smaller and a four inch, which is larger. Mm-hmm. The inch and a half was probably borderline yeah. um, from a fruit size and a particle size to getting clogged out. So we upsized it to a three inch to make sure we wouldn't have any issues with that. Yep. 
Yeah, and so we, it was also a flapper pump as well. Yes. Yep, so yeah. our stainless steel flapper, yep. yep. And, and it is important uh, when we look at the size of a material, it's not always what the maximum opening size is. So mm -hmm. for the, the, uh, the 1590 um, style, I believe that's one, 1. 1.2 inches or something along yeah. those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why we went to the three inches, the, the cut or the dice on uh, some of these items, they're all under an inch yeah. in size. But when you think about an entire chamber filled with this, you know, mm -hmm. this material. Now you're looking at these things connecting or pushing together as they're going through mm -hmm. it and that, and you can, you know, essentially run into clogged situations. Yeah. So, yeah. So what, uh, what type of performance did we get out of this pump? <laughs> it's actually a little bit surprising for me. Uh, we've done a lot of testing with, you know, different particles and uh, different types of material with solids in it. Uh, the flow rate was very, very good at a very, very low, um, PSI, or very, very yeah. low air pressure. I was stunned how quickly it loaded. Mm -hmm. And once we turned it on at a very, very low rate, we didn't even go full bore with this. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine how uh, how much this would be pushing through. Right. We'd be very, very near um, from a performance standpoint what, it, what we marked. And that's as. due to the fact that it, this was like a watery type right. liquid mixture mm -hmm. with the fruit, right? So your viscosity is pretty low, which made it pretty easy to get optimal performance yeah. out of the pump right i'll say the one thing that i saw i'm not a technical expert or anything but the fruit looked the same going in yep. as it did coming out which is very important yep especially like those uh really soft maraschino cherries mm -hmm. and uh the peaches yeah it all looked uh, like it's supposed to yeah and it was that once again is, is a big surprise mm -hmm. um not necessarily that the pump performed in that way but i hadn't seen it mm -hmm. uh, in, that, in that capacity so it was very very cool to see and I had my hands in it so it was, I actually <laughs> yeah. got to feel before and after kind of what the consistency was yep. and it mm -hmm. was basically what we had in the container was basically the exact same on the outside and from a, a customer standpoint that's exactly what they're looking for yeah. they yep. want that going into those cups and uh, or containers or, or cans mm -hmm. uh, in that pristine condition so that the consumers see it and say hey I can this identify what it is. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yep. Uh, and so we did take uh, photos and videos of those tests. And so we'll make sure that those are linked in the description below on this video. Um, and they'll be up on LinkedIn as well. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about uh, cleaning, right? Um, typically, what type of cleaning regimen would we have uh, when we're looking at a, a fruit transferring pump? Well, most of the guys are going to want to CIP it. <clears throat> um, you know, diaphragm pumps we say you know they are cip above but it depends on the material you're pumping mm -hmm. fruit's probably okay especially if you're using a uh, overmold diaphragm but you need to test it in your facility and make sure um if they're pumping a single kind of fruit you'll probably see people flush it out and clean it in between runs right you don't want to pump pineapple and then come right through and pump cherries with it and then go back to something else because you're going to get cross contamination right um, if it's just fruit cocktail all day long then they probably let it run for um, however long it's going to run, either a shift like a day and then they clean it or, you know, with fruit, high sugar content, maybe they can get two or three days out of it before they flush it out. Um, a lot of that depends on their requirements and their swab tests in the plant. Jeremy, have anything to add on that? No. no? That's, okay. that's pretty solid. Cool. <laughs> All right. Um, so we also did a cleaning test on this pump. Uh, so, Jeremy, you want to kind of walk through how did we set up our cleaning here in the lab? Yeah, so this is just really, really highlighting – uh, the, the overmolar diaphragm. Uh, we wanted right. to see kind of where we were sitting with uh, that diaphragm before and after the test or before and after we ran the, the demonstration. So we essentially filled a 55 gallon drum uh, with water, hot water, mm -hmm. water, uh, and we just ran a flush test. Yeah, no chemicals, correct. No chemicals right. added. Uh, we just ran a, a basic flush of the system. We ran the pump, we let it do the work for us, uh, and we just wanted to kind of see what it looked like before and what it would look like after. Um, the process mm -hmm. and uh, results were, I mean, pretty good. Yeah. For mm -hmm. just for thinking that it was a single 55 gallon drum and that we ran that material one time through mm -hmm. it and knowing what a CIP process oftentimes is right. uh, and recognizing that oftentimes that is a prolonged period of time mm -hmm. with very, very aggressive steam, chemicals, uh, water. Really, really impressive. And that mm -hmm. goes to Jeff's point about depending on the ingredient. Sometimes you need more, sometimes mm -hmm. you need less, as long as it matches what the, the quality standard, sure. safety standard is. Yeah, yeah. when we were taking the pump apart, it looked pretty clean. 
you know, we didn't do any swab tests or we didn't do any sort of like lab tests or anything, but from the naked eye, it looked, uh, looked very clean with the stainless steel. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess my question on this is we use the high, the high sanitation pump that we have, the three inch. Mm -hmm. Would a food grade pump also be able to handle this product as well? Mm, well, um, possibly, but we don't offer flapper pumps oh, on a true. food grade pump. Um, so in order to pass the solids, you would want to go with high sanitary pump. I also think that, um, you know, Jeremy's point earlier about the pineapple and the acidity, um, a high sand pump is probably going to be a little bit better just because the surface finish is better. You're not going to have the porous stuff that can possibly pick up stuff in a plant and give you issues with mm -hmm. corrosion and that kind of stuff, uh, whereas a food grade pump does. So. Got it. Cool. Um, well, do you guys have any uh, any parting thoughts or anything else uh, that's on your mind before we uh, wrap up today? I guess the only thing that I would add is uh, we're talking about fruit cocktail here. Um, yeah. And I, I would also say that uh, what we do in the fruit cocktail or what we would see in a fruit cocktail is very similar to what we would see in a canned vegetable mm -hmm. area as well. So you think about sure. peas and things like that. There's very similar mm -hmm. in nature. They're all plant-based um, yep. and they all have consistency factors to them. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about here, um, you can do with green beans and carrots and things like that yep. as well. Um, and with these flapper pumps, you see that uh, you're able to keep uh, that material mm -hmm. going in and coming out looking the same and having the same quality. Yep. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, appreciate you sitting down with me today. Um, yeah, so today we talked about the characteristics of fruit cocktail, uh, things to keep in mind when preparing the product, the uh, build specs out for the pump. Uh, we talked about the tests that we ran here at Graco. Uh, so click here. Uh, to see the video on the test, click here to see the video on the cleaning. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Uh, our link is uh, in the description down below. Uh, like this video, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Bye.